Okay, good afternoon everyone. I think it's about half past two, so we should start. Um, the title of this talk, 25 Years of Research in the Department of Chemistry. Many of you will know that last year I completed 25 years here as a, as a lecturer. And I was thinking at the time it would be quite nice to give, you know, some sort of, some sort of overview, presentation of what I've been doing. And one's always busy and I thought, well, you know, perhaps it would be a nice thing to do, but I didn't actually get around to doing anything about it. And then about a week ago, Barbara Parr wrote round saying, I'm desperate for people to do a colloquium, you know, could somebody stand in? So I thought, well, why not do it? I apologise if it's not completely polished because I haven't had so much time to, to polish it, but yeah, hopefully it will, be, it will be okay. I intend to have a fairly general overview. I don't want to get bogged down in too much very specific science. I rather want to tell people the sort of things that I've been doing over this, this last 25 years. And I've promised a few connections to various things, which we'll have to see if we can find those as we go through. The connections are rather tenuous, but they are there if you, if you look for them. I'll explain that. So, the first thing is, as an inorganic chemist, we're always a little bit cavalier with numbers. So, if either 25 years actually goes back almost immediately a little bit further, because my research career in this department actually began before I was, uh, um, before I was a lecturer here, in 1981, when I did a final year project with, with Robin Walsh. And the aim of this project was to look at the germanium hydrogen bond strength in germane. And we did this by reacting germane with iodine, monitoring the kinetics of the reaction, which you could do spectroscopically, because iodine is a nice purple colour. And if you react, then the purple colour disappears, so you can monitor the reaction. And by measuring the Arrhenius parameters, by doing this at different temperatures, you could measure an activation barrier for the reaction. And by a number of assumptions, which is what kineticists do, you could extract a bond enthalpy for this, this compound. And is it a reasonable estimate? Well, one thing is to compare it with other things that are known. And... I think at the time, this was the best measurement of this, this particular bond enthalpy, a reasonably fundamental thing. You can compare it with the bond enthalpy in silane, and it's a bit less. And lots of students here, who've, many of whom have been through my second year lectures, will know that something I talk about quite often is the strength of bonding to hydrogen as you go down a group in the periodic table, that you expect it to get less because the orbitals don't overlap so well with the hydrogen 1s orbital. So it seems like a reasonable sort of estimate. Certainly something I enjoy doing. I mean, in retrospect, probably quite a challenging final year project. You know, we had to make an air-sensitive compound, distill it on a vacuum line, do some reactions with it. But we did get a paper published. And this was my first publication. It came out in Chax, which is quite nice. In some ways, you could say that's a good time to stop. You know, you've published your project in Chax. That's perhaps a good time for, for finishing it's a bit like cricket, you know, if you stroke your first ball for, for four, then perhaps the best thing to do is to get out before people can say that you don't stroke all your balls for four. But there's a, you know, it was a nice start. I then went away from Reading, and the next stage of my career was I went up to, to Oxford to do my DPhil, and I worked with Tony Downs. That's not the Tony Downs who we find at this university as a Deputy Vice-Chancellor. This is Tony Downs who is a matrix isolation spectroscopist. I see a number of fourth-year students around here, or people who were in the fourth year last year, who will know about matrix isolation, because I do some lectures on this. And this is looking at reactions of molecules at low temperatures. And the specific thing that we wanted to investigate while I was at Oxford was looking at the reaction of metal carbonyls with oxygen. And... You do this by photochemistry. You've got to put some energy into the reaction somehow, and you do it by photolyzing the, the reaction mixture. And what did we find out? Well, you can control the reaction by photolyzing at different wavelengths. And if you're lucky, your different intermediates absorb light at different places. And if they absorb light at different places, you have a chance of building up one intermediate over another. And then you can identify particular intermediates. 
If you're unlucky, the absorption bands will sit on top of each other, and it's actually very difficult to pick out a specific intermediate. You end up with a situation where you can perhaps see where you start or where you finish, but pulling out the intermediates is more difficult. With these metal carbonyls, many of the intermediates actually came out quite well, and the interest is that you're making metal carbonyls where the metal has a high oxidation state. So that's a little bit unusual because you normally expect carbonyls only to be stable with low oxidation states. These have high oxidation states. Probably the main, um, the main discovery that I made during my PhD was to make this complex and to characterise it fully a trans dioxo complex of, of molybdenum carbonyl, the plus four oxidation state. This complex of chromium had previously been made in matrices, but molybdenum behaves just a little bit differently. You might say, you know, how do you tell that you've made that? And at the time I was doing my PhD, computer modeling was at a very early stage and wasn't used very much. The modern method in matrix isolation is to get some spectra for intermediates to model what you think that intermediate is by doing some sort of ab initio type calculation or semi empirical type calculation, then match the spectra and tweak things until you get a very good match. And that wasn't so possible. And really, things had to be done by isotopic substitution and sort of very careful working through the spectra to try to identify what you'd, what you'd got. And one of the little problems, which is quite interesting, is that if you have a unit like this, a dioxo unit, where the oxygen-oxygen bond is broken, the infrared stretch actually goes very close to the oxygen-oxygen stretch of one where the oxygen molecule isn't broken. And it's not always easy to distinguish the two. And the classical way of distinguishing these was to substitute the molecule with a mixture that includes the mixed isotope 16O, 18O. And the reason that that can distinguish the two is that if you have the dioxo unit, the one that's up here on the, on the left-hand side, you have a symmetric and an asymmetric stretch. And in C2V symmetry, which is what we have there, they don't mix with each other for the pure isotopes, but for the mixed isotopes, the symmetry is lowered and the two vibrations mix, and they push each other apart. So if you get the three isotopes, you see an asymmetrical triplet of bands. For the asymmetric and the symmetric stretch, these two bands push each other apart, whereas if you have the peroxo unit, where the oxygen-oxygen bond is intact, there's no reason for that to happen, so you get a symmetrical distribution of bands, and that's a classical way of trying to distinguish those two units by vibrational spectroscopy. So we had some success doing this. We published some work. We got some nice spectra. Probably the breakthrough in my PhD was when we actually saw molybdenum isotope <laughs> structure on the asymmetric stretch of this molecule. And you could see that in the, in the spectrum at the top, the top corner there. The middle spectrum is our observed spectrum. And these little peaks that come out in here are due to the different isotopes of molybdenum. We needed a Fourier transform infrared spectrometer to do that. Commonplace nowadays, we didn't have one in Oxford at the time. And I had to go to Nottingham, where Jim Turner and Martin Polyarkov had an instrument like that. And I spent a week there recording spectra. And there's sometimes a point in a PhD when you sort of know you've got the PhD. And I think my point in that was when I got this spectrum and I realized it was exactly what I expected to see for this molecule. You know, it's a nice stage to get at. And we also did the 18 oxygen experiment with that. And this shows that there is, you get the molybdenum isotope structure and the 18 oxygen isotope structure from the same, same spectrum. So that really was my background when I came back to Reading um, in 1986 to start here as a, as a lecturer. To start with, as is very often the case, I didn't have any students, you know, you normally begin. But what I did have was a bit of spare time. I mean, that seems a, a rare commodity nowadays, but at the time... You're not quite so busy. So I had a bit of time to do some experiments for myself. There was a German visitor came to the department who worked with me for a, a term or so. And I really looked at two things. First of all, looked at if you keep on photolyzing these things, you eventually knock off all the COs and you make isolated oxide molecules. And there's a bit of interest in looking, you know, we tend to think of oxides as being solids, you know, with the atoms all packed together into a solid array. 
one way of making isolated molecules from that is to heat it up, get oxides in the vapour, but if you heat it up, you might not get the same thing as you would have in the solid at room temperature. You, get lots of, you could get some chemistry going on. This is another approach to get isolated um, molecular metal oxides, effectively to use the carbonyl to put a metal atom into the matrix, and then react off the carbonyl groups and make a metal oxide molecule. So that was really where I began life as a researcher at Reading. We looked at chromium dioxide, and we wrote up a paper, and we published a, a paper. Um, I still feel guilty about the fact that I put down my German visitors in part on here. I, I was advised to do that by a senior person. That's not something I've ever done since. You know, if somebody works with me, I always treat them as an absolutely equal partner. I think that's how it ought to be. So I still feel a little bit guilty about that. Um, but we've got the same sort of spectra. These are the typical, they're, they're rather messy, but you can interpret them. You look for the asymmetric and symmetric structures, and you look for isotopic substitutions. So what we're looking at as we go up these spectra here are different isotopic substitutions with 16 and 18 oxygen, looking at the splittings, trying to interpret the spectra. It's sort of rather detailed, time-consuming work, but nonetheless very interesting. And an interesting reaction that I looked at about this time is that we found if you take manganese Mn2CO10, well-known organometallic compound, and you photolyze that in an oxygen doped argon matrix, you could take off all the carbonyl groups and you could end up with Mn2O7, a well-known explosive compound, but reasonably safe if you make it in little bits in a low temperature matrix, it's sort of okay. There's an awful lot of chemistry going on there, and I've never re-explored really this, never looked again at what's happening, but you're breaking an awful lot of bonds and you're making an awful lot of bonds. There's a lot happening. We couldn't pick up intermediates in this reaction, and I think that's just down to, if you like, bad luck in the sense that um, the intermediates have absorption bands that all sit on top of each other, and we just, whatever wavelengths we photolyze that, I could never pull out one intermediate above another intermediate. But there's no doubt about the spectra. The spectra are clear cut. You can see um, you can see the bands of the oxide growing in. You, know, you start off, that's when you the metal oxide region, you start off there's nothing there really, and you can see these bands growing in. There's no doubt about what they are. They're very clear. They shift with 18 oxygen. The top spectrum on that page there is 18 oxygen. Um, so the bottom spectrum is 18 oxygen. The top spectrum is 16. They shift as you'd expect. And it's, you know, quite, quite interesting. One thing I'd realised when I came here is that you could do interesting things, but you also had to be a little bit pragmatic and do things where you might reasonably expect to perhaps get a little bit of money or a bit of, um, you know, get students and so on. Matrix isolation, I figured, wasn't a, a terribly good bet for, for that. Um, and I think I was right. I mean, actually, nowadays, matrix isolation has pretty much disappeared in the UK. The only person who until recently has been, been doing any of that sort of work is Nigel Young at Hull, but I think even he's now finished. And it is a case where if you really don't give any money for a particular area, eventually people are quite inventive up to a point in keeping things going, but eventually it's going to disappear. And matrix isolation is something that's, that's disappeared in, in this country. So yeah, there's just a little summary. Perhaps just before I move on, just to say the last point on here, we also looked at photolyzing things like organometallics with carbonyl groups, like CPMnCO3 with carbonyl groups on, and you could make, by photolyzing these in oxygen dope matrices, you could make organometallics with high oxidation state metals. These sort of things are quite well known for rhenium. High oxidation state rhenium with organometallic groups are known. For manganese, not well known. This was sort of one of the first observations of something something like that. So CP is a cyclopentadienyl group attached to a manganese in the plus four oxidation state. Yeah, a little bit unusual. That's the nice thing about matrix isolation. You can make unusual things. So 
this was the, the situation. And one thing I'd discussed at my interview, because I knew when I was interviewed here, they'd want me to have a few ideas about how I might set about raising a bit of money. That's even more important nowadays, but even at that time it was a bit important. You'd uh, think of some things that you know, perhaps were a bit more industrially related and so on. And there's a technique of a lot of interest at that time called metal organic chemical vapor deposition, or MOCVD. David Rice was one of my senior colleagues at that time. He had an interest in this. And I saw that the work I was doing with matrix isolation, looking at organometallic reagents, transporting them in the gas phase, photolyzing them, doing reactions of them, actually had quite a bit of relevance to MOCVD. And that by moving a little bit into that sort of area, I perhaps moved myself into somewhere where there was a chance of getting a little bit more money. And the aim here was to do things like looking at weak or strong addicts. What do we mean by 2,6 or 3,5 compounds? They're essentially things with a valency of 2 and a valency of 6. So it can be things, the 2s are often things like zinc, cadmium and mercury in the periodic table, and the sixes there would be things like sulfur, selenium, tellurium, three fives, the threes, you know, aluminium, gallium, indium, and the fives, things like phosphorus, arsenic, antimony, and so on. Those who know something about semiconductors will know that four is quite a magic number, you know, silicon, if you have a half-filled um, half band of electrons, then you can get semiconductor properties, which is why people are interested in things like two six or, or three five because they're sort of equivalent in number of electrons to things like silicon. And what we were interested in was could we look at either strong or weak interactions between these sort of compounds? Do they transport in the gas phase? If you're using organometallics as precursors, and the idea of an MOCVD experiment is you take organometallic reagents, pass them over a hot substrate, and grow a layer of your semiconductor or other type of material onto your hot substrate, do these things actually transport in the gas phase, or do they not? How do they interact with each other? If you take some of the weaker things that you expect to have a weak interaction, like, for example, cadmium and tellurium, do they actually interact with each other? You know, once again, people who've listened to my second-year lectures will know the donor properties of main group atoms go down as you go down the group. You know, ammonia, nitrogen is a very strong electron pair donor, but phosphorus isn't. You go down to things like tellurium, do they actually form an interaction with weak Lewis acids? So we had a, a sort of twofold strategy here um, to look at weak interactions in low temperature matrices. So to do things like looking at dimethyl cadmium with tellurium or selenium donor atoms, and then to look at stronger interactions with things like nitrogen and oxygen, and there you might actually isolate some of these adducts and perhaps be able to look at structures, see what the structural form of them was, X-ray diffraction, and I even moved into working with David Rice to do some gas electron diffraction on these, which is an excellent technique, because gas electron diffraction actually shows you the structure that's being transported in the gas phase. If you get the solid X-ray structure, you know that's the structure of the solid, but you don't necessarily know that that's what's being transported in the, in the gas. So gas electron diffraction is very important. And this actually led to us producing um, a number of different papers looking on sort of structural chemistry. We had a number of crystal structures or gas electron diffraction structures. So there's an example of, um, this is an example of a gas electron diffraction structure. This is dimethyl, dimethyl cadmium. If we look at this part of the molecule, is dimethyl cadmium, and it's bound to this bidentate nitrogen ligand, and that transports intact in the gas phase. So it's a good way of delivering this reagent into an MOCPD system, and the gas phase structure is, I think, quite, quite clear in that case. Um, we also looked at some solid structures. We did X-ray structures. So some of them come out as polymers. You see, this is one that isn't such a useful structure because it probably has the wrong type of donor atoms. We've got dimethyl cadmium in the middle. And this is an oxygen donor molecule, but it's 
got the oxygens separate from each other at opposite ends of the molecule. So instead of forming a sort of compact molecule that will transform into gas phase, it's forming a linear polymer, which isn't going to be so useful. It's going to be hard to get that into the gas phase. So these were the sort of, sort of things that we, we looked at. I even dabbled in NMR at this stage by looking at some cadmium NMR spectra. You get some really nice... So this is the proton. Actually, this is a proton spectrum. But, so this is a cadmium-113 NMR spectrum, but showing coupling to the methyl protons. And the coupling to the methyl protons gives us a septet. There are six equivalent protons, and you get some nice septet patterns in the cadmium NMR. Why look at it? Because you can see a chemical shift if the cadmium is bound to the, to the ligand. So that if you look in solution, if the cadmium is remaining bound to the ligand, you see a chemical shift, which if it isn't bound to the ligand, you won't see. So it's a way of looking to see if, it, if it's bound to the ligand in, in solution. So this was an interesting piece of work, and what happened here is I got my first student out of this, and I promised that I'd have three interesting connections in this lecture. The first being perhaps a bit tenuous, to the, the Spice Girls, who were famous a bit later on than this, the coalition government. What links these were? The links came through through weddings, actually. And the first link, Carol Yates, was my very first PhD student, and she'd started a PhD, and a couple of months into it, she said, could I please have a few days off? I've been asked to be a bridesmaid at a wedding, and she was the bridesmaid for one of the students who'd been an undergraduate with her, a girl called Susan Firth. You can tell this is a long time ago. We had students called Su Susan. is now a very old-fashioned name. But at the time, it was a, a more fashionable sort of name. So she went off to Sue Firth's wedding, and she came back a few days later. So how, how was it? Did you enjoy it? So it was all right, but there was this young girl there who was really, really strange. She was dressed in weird clothes, really, really peculiar. And, so, and it turned out the bride's... The Sue Firth's husband, the person she married, was called Heliwell. And this young girl was Jerry Helliwell, who was at the wedding. And before she became famous as a Spice Girl, she was then aged about 12 or something, because the brother was much older. So we still in this department have a graduate who's Susan Helliwell nowadays. And Susan Helliwell is the sister-in-law to Jerry Helliwell, the Spice Girl. So this department has its link to the Spice Girls that are really old-fashioned to most of this audience. But at the time, quite... quite um, yeah, quite fashionable. So there we, we have unusual links there. And then came another wedding. And this wedding, actually, my next two students, Carolyn Jenkins and Michael Beer, actually got married to each other. So they got married to each other and they invited me down to the wedding. And I turned up at the wedding. And here's the link to the coalition government, as I found that one of the guests there was William Hague. And William Hague, at that time, was not so well known as now but he was beginning to rise a bit through the, through the ranks, you know, and get on. We thought, well, what's William Haig there for? That is because Carolyn Jenkins' cousin is Fian Jenkins, and Fian Jenkins is William Haig's wife. So we also have a graduate of this department who's quite closely related to, to William Haig. I think this was terribly upsetting to Michael Beer and a bit to Carolyn, but my, Michael I would describe his politics as the very old side of old Labour and having a sort of rising star from the Tory party at his wedding I think wasn't quite to his liking but uh, I think he put a brave face on it and you know smiled during the day and, and put up with it all so there are my first two links and they're as I say a little bit tenuous but nonetheless they're there one of the interesting things, actually, in a long career in a university is you do get links to all sorts of different interesting people. You know, I think that's one thing that really does happen. So what happened next? Well, I carried on doing this sort of work. And then a little bit after this time, um, George and I were chatting. And, you know, George has always had a strong interest in atmospheric chemistry. And we did have a think about, you know, can you use matrix isolation to look at some atmospheric chemical reactions. Uh, one of the interests is in um, you know, trying to combine the results that you get from flow systems, looking at say, the fast reaction techniques, flash photolysis, looking at intermediates that way. Can you combine them with um, 
can you combine them with matrix isolation results where rather than trying to detect your intermediate on a very fast time scale, you freeze it down and do conventional spectroscopy to try to sort out what it was. And quite a few people over the years have tried to make this sort of, sort of match. So George and I thought we'd have a, have a look at this sort of thing. And we had a bit of an impetus at that time that people had found a good new source of OH radicals for um, matrix isolation spectroscopy which is simply you can take an adduct of urea and H2O2 and if you heat it up you get pretty pure H2O2 in the gas phase. It's very, very hard to get pure H2O2 if you try to distill it from water. It's always full of water and your matrix gets full of water peaks and you can't tell what you've made. But if you get pure H2O2 and then you photolyze at the right wavelength, you can get fairly pure OH radicals being formed from it. And this is... Um, yeah, this makes the work a lot easier to do. We also looked at ozone. It was interesting, but George and I, every time we compared results, we could never do things that were under similar enough conditions to make a bit of a, com a proper comparison. You know, George would say, I want it doing like this, because to compare it, it's got to be like that. So I mean, you, can't, you can't have a flow rate like that into a matrix. It won't work. You can only deposit very, very slowly. And you could never quite bridge that gap in between the two. But it was interesting work, and it led to us producing one or two papers. We published a paper on ozonides, which came out in one of the Elsevier journals, and then we published a paper on the hydroxyl radicals, which Elsevier seemed to like because they have a prize, which is the Sir Harold Thompson Prize, for what they considered to be their best paper of vibrational spectroscopy in spectrochemical actor during a year. We were shortlisted for this prize. So I promised that there'd be a connection between my work and the 1966 England cup winning side. And the very tenuous link there is Sir Harold Thompson, for whom this prize is awarded. Ian is in the audience. Ian know, knew Sir Harold Thompson, I believe, quite well. So um, Sir Harold Thompson was an interesting figure because he was a vibrational spectroscopist and a professor at Oxford University. But at the same time, he was president of the Football Association. He did that in his spare time. He was... President of the Football Association when Sir Alf Ramsey was appointed, and he was president while England won the World Cup in 1966. My understanding, and Ian will correct me if I'm if I'm wrong in this, but at the time there was a rule that if Sir Harold went in a rule that if Sir Harold went into a room where footballers were present, the footballers were required to stand up in his presence. Is what I've I've heard. I don't believe that would happen nowadays. We could try the experiment of a university professor walking into a room where David Beckham is sitting to see if David Beckham stands up. I suspect he wouldn't. But that shows the changing social position between the 1960s and the 2000 odds. My all understanding also is that Sir Harold was never fully keen on Alf Ramsey. He always thought that Alf Ramsey had got a little bit above himself. And when England failed to qualify for one of the World Cups in the 1970s, Sir Harold was quite quick to latch onto that and to help to push in the direction of getting rid of Alf Ramsey as England's manager. So Harold Thompson was involved very much in, in England's football in some way in the 1960s. He then put up this prize for Elsevier to award, which we were shortlisted for, but sadly didn't win. So we dabbled a bit in atmospheric chemistry around that time. And then, just a little bit later than this, we tried another attempt to combine the results of fast physical chemistry detection methods and slow matrix isolation methods. And Robin Walsh and Steve Ogden, a colleague from Southampton who does matrix isolation in a slightly different way from me. He was very keen on making high temperature molecules, heating things up, putting them into the vapor phase. They're rapidly condensing them. And Pat Kennedy was a theoretical chemist. Uh, we felt between us we'd covered all the bases for doing this type of work. And we wanted to look at reactive silicon species and then to compare this to gas phase reactions and to try to work out what was going on a little bit by doing... Um, some theoretical calculations. One of the molecules that people have always been interested in in silicon chemistry is a very simple molecule, which is the silicon analogue of, of acetone. It's very hard to produce, 
it polymerizes because silicon oxygen double bonds are not very strong and silicon oxygen single bonds by comparison are quite strong and therefore the you know the the sort of thermodynamics for this species is always to always to react to form polymers and we also want to look at reactive divalent silicon compounds like SiCl2 SiH2 and SiO, and to compare the results from kinetic measurements that Robin was doing by flash photolysis with matrix isolation measurements. And we had a little bit of success in doing this type of work. Um, one thing we looked at was to look at cyclic siloxanes. I mean, these really are your silicon acetone, if you like, all stuck together. You can produce different sizes of rings by sticking these together. And there's the thought that if you heat these up, you might be able to spit out um, Si, Me2, SiO might spit out of that, you know, if you break the ring apart. There's evidence that this happens. Somebody called Habashescu published work on this in the 1980s. And it's proposed that you actually can make this when you heat it up. But then you get decomposition, you make silicon, SiO can be seen in these matrices, you get a small amount of silicon monoxide, and you get a mixture of hydrocarbons, which if you think about the um, possible mechanisms, and you have a reasonably <coughs> imaginative theoretical chemist to work with, you can understand how you can make these different hydrocarbons from the methyl radicals. So we looked at, at that type of work, and you get, these are the sort of spectra you get if you heat these up. Um, you could see that a whole range of hydrocarbons are being produced there, CH4. C2H6 is obvious from the v radicals, but you can also explain how you can get things like ethene coming out there. Very interestingly, D4 is this one with four silicon monomers in it, and D3 is the one that has three silicon monomers in it. And you can clearly see when you heat up the one with four in that you end up with some of the one with three in, which is a sort of bit of, you know, rather perhaps tangential evidence that you're getting spitting out a, a monomer. Um, and you see these, these hydrocarbons. You don't see evidence of ME2SIO itself. It's difficult to spot. <laughs> we also looked at linear siloxanes. Linear siloxanes are interesting because their formula don't quite correspond as the, the cyclic ones are exact polymers of Me2SiO, but the linear ones are not. You have to have something extra in there, the hydrogens or the methyl groups and so on. So the interest there is what's happening to the hydrogens if you pyrolyze these. Do you get similar things happening? Well, you could see, again, you get spectra. The intensities are not great, but you start to see lots of different hydrocarbons. And you can see things... I think these things labelled A and B up here, these things labelled A and B have silicon hydrogen um, stretching vibrations. And you can, with a bit of imagination again, and with a bit of help from a theoretical chemist, you can perhaps begin to understand what's going on there. So we see some hydrocarbons, we see a number of new bands, the intensities are quite low. We see bands in the SI stretching region. There's some thought these might be Me2, Si, H2 seems to, seems to be produced, and you can account for that if you think about the mechanisms. And if you look at L2, so L2 is, um, L2 is this one with three silicon atoms. L1 is the sort of smallest polymeric thing you can have, because if you have less than two, then it's the monomer. Um, and there's evidence that L2 converts into L1 when you heat it up, which is, again, sort of rather circumstantial evidence that perhaps you are spitting out this heavy 2 SiO molecule from, from that. So that was some of our thought. I then began some other experiments at about that, that this sort of time, which was to... So, actually, perhaps what I should just say before I finish with that, we, we did these reactions on the siloxanes, but we looked at other silicon containing species. We looked at, for example, heating up um, SiCl4, SiCl6, doing reactions in matrices, trying to 
get these by heating them to spit out SiCl2. Now look at the reactions of SiCl2. And then we did combined matrix isolation and, um, and kinetic studies on SiCl2 with different oxygen donors. Made a, a series of things there. Robin is a very fine man to collaborate with. You know, he's a very, very good scientist, and we did a lot of interesting work there. And this actually also led to my second publication in JAX, which I've had two. This one came 22 years after the first one. So if I hang around for one long enough, maybe I'll get another one in due course. But so I've got another 15 years or something to wait for that nice thing to come around again. Okay, with Peter Hollins, one thing I've been thinking about for some time is I've been very interested in looking at reactions in matrices, which are essentially quite amorphous <laughs> sort of solids. What happens if you start looking at things in single crystals? You know, if you've got things that are much more ordered, so you have things that are very ordered to start with. You know, the molecules are already lined up in some way, so that they're already, perhaps the reaction's already part way to happening, you know, because of the alignment of the, of the monomers. And Peter was interested in this idea as well. And we were also both interested in developing infrared microscopy at that time. And infrared microscopy is a very good way of looking at a single crystal. You can study the crystal, and you can then irradiate it in situ, and you can monitor spectral changes. So at first we did it by getting a crystal, irradiating it for a bit, putting it back in the microscope and seeing what happened. And then we thought, well, we could do better than this, we can take a light pipe to bring the UV light onto the crystal and we can monitor the spectra in situ to see what's happening as we go along. And we can do some sort of kinetics. I mean, whatever the kinetics completely mean. Um, we were looking at this type of reaction. This is trans-synamic acid. It's trans around this double bond um, or a derivative of trans-synamic acid. Synamic acid has a, um, a phenyl group at one end and a carboxyl group at the other end, and you can have different derivatives. You can put different derivatives onto the, onto the phenyl group, and that influences the, the reactions a bit. You can get two different dimers. You can get this type, which is seen as a head-to-head -head dimer, where the two phenols line up with each other, or it can go the other way around. You can have the two phenols opposite each other. And if you put in... Um, derivatives like nitro groups, it tends to push it the other way around. And the reason for that is that when you make the crystal, the monomers line up in different ways in the crystal. The monomers are lined up in a particular way in the crystal, and when you irradiate it, they stick together in the way that they're already lined up. So there's this sort of, people talk about these things like crystal engineering, you know, that you could use the crystal to force your reaction into a particular direction, make it go in a direction you want. This is quite a nice example. And from a spectroscopic point of view, if you have the head-to-tail ones, they're not far off having a centre of symmetry. So if you could do infrared and Raman spectra, you could start to see things that are a bit close to obey the mutual exclusion principle. The infrared bands tend to all be quite a bit stronger than the Raman bands. It's not purely, it doesn't purely have a centre of symmetry, but it's getting, getting quite close to that. So we did some experiments. Actually, I think we did some, some quite nice things. Um, you can monitor the reaction on a kinetically, and you could get lots and lots and lots of these scans, but you can see a peak here of the monomer is disappearing with time, and a peak of the um, dimer is increasing with time, and you can monitor that over a, quite a nice time period. This is for the 2,4 dichloro derivative that we've put up here. That gave particularly nice results, and you can get nice first order kinetic plots from it, exactly what that means. We weren't quite sure. We got these very nice kinetic plots, and then we, we sort of thought about it. Well, that's exactly what is that telling us? But it certainly obeys some nice, nice kinetics. But other ones don't. I mean, these are the 2-chloro and the 4-chloro, and the 2-chloro is pretty close to a first-order plot, and the 4-chloro isn't. It really, you know, deviates off quite a bit at the end. And we did quite a few experiments of this type and never completely understood why we saw differences. But we do. If people are expert crystallographers and have some good ideas, then do let me know. You know, there's something of interest that's happened, happened there.
So these are the specific things. You know, we looked at head-to-head -head or head-to-tail dimers, looking at those, depending on the substituents. We looked at reactions in situ in single crystals, and we monitored, monitored the kinetic data. So everything I've told you up till now has been probably quite mainstream chemistry. It's been some inorganics and physical, perhaps deviated a bit towards organic chemistry. I was quite proud to publish one of these papers in Perkin Transactions. I've only published one paper in Perkin, but people always like to publish something in the type of journal that isn't their specialism. You know, if they're an inorganic chemist, getting something in an organic journal they think is a bigger, a bigger step somehow, but whether that's right, but it just feels like it's something a bit more, a bit more of an achievement. In the sort of latter part of my career, I've moved a little bit to applying my knowledge of infrared into areas of analytical chemistry that are perhaps not so much mainstream chemistry. And the two specific things that come to mind, first of all, is scientific archaeology, and secondly is forensics. And quite a lot of this was actually sort of student-driven. It wasn't necessarily a choice that I directly made you know, from a research perspective, but we were having new degrees in chemistry with archaeology, chemistry with forensic analysis, and I felt it was important that to give credibility to degrees like this that there should be research opportunities for students studying on them. So that if somebody does chemistry with forensic analysis, there are possibilities to do research projects in that area and perhaps to publish work in that area. And I saw also that infrared spectroscopy could be useful, and that was quite a lot of what drove me in that sort of direction. Another nice thing is that these type of projects are things that students can get on with quite a lot themselves. You know, they're not experimentally quite as difficult as some of the chemistry projects, and people can have a bit more independence on working, perhaps, on that type of work, even as an undergraduate. And it's more possible, perhaps, for undergraduates to get work to a publishable stage in something like a forensic type, type project. So what sort of things have I done? Well, I was looking at you know, analytical applications and I found, fortunately, three archaeologists and Stuart is sort of archaeology stroke forensics, but three people who were very keen to collaborate, Wendy Matthews, a scientific archaeologist, Martin Bell, Stuart Black, they were all keen to, to collaborate on things. So we've done some very interesting projects together. So let me just talk you through a few examples. Uh, this is the you know, starting point of a piece of archaeology, is going to a site and looking at things and collecting things. And this is one of my students out at Chadlhoyuk, which is a Neolithic village in, in Turkey, a Neolithic town in fact, it's a very large town, taking samples. And we're interested in the plaster work that goes into these buildings. These are some floor plasters, but you get these layers, horizontal layers of floor plasters, and on the walls of vertical layers of wall plasters. And we're interested in how they made these. You know, what did they make them out of? How often did they do it? What's the, what's the chemistry of these things? Um, this is the sort of procedure that one follows. You know, this is where you are on the site, you cut a block, you take out your block, and you bring it back, and you impregnate it with resin, and then you cut it down to a thin, a thin slide that you can look at under a microscope, um, typically about 30 micrometers thick. They have a machine in archaeology for grinding these slides down. If you want to do infrared, you mustn't put a cover slip on top, because it's no good if you have a glass slide, because glass absorbs the infrared. That's something we had to teach the archaeologists. And eventually, you get down to a, a slide where you can look at... So you get a big slide like that, and then you can look at an individual part of the slide, and you can start to see under a microscope the individual layers of plaster, that within a layer like this, a big piece of plaster on the wall of a site, it breaks down into a lot of individual layers. You could look at that by optical microscopy, or perhaps under a polarizing microscope, something like that. But what we're interested in doing is to do some infrared microscopy. And with a modern infrared microscope, you can produce so-called Kenny maps, which is where you map the intensity of certain features across the, across the slide. So you look at things that you know what they are. Here we have calcium carbonate, the middle spectrum. So dark blue is where there's a lot of it. Light blue is where there's not so much is clays, and on the right-hand side, quartz. And the obvious implication here is that alternate layers on this slide are made from clays, 
are made from carbonate containing lime, lime plasters. We think that effectively what they were doing was they put a layer of clay, which is quite cheap, on their wall, cover up all the smoke and the soot and so on, and then a layer of this lime plaster, which was a very brilliant white colour. But we know that they had to go some distance from their site to get this, about six kilometres or so. So it's probably quite valuable stuff. And we know that because we've been able to match the chemistry to different sources of material. So, you know, they, this was probably quite valuable stuff, and it made their houses look nice. We think they probably did this about once or twice a year. Now, these buildings typically lasted for about 70 years, which, in terms of the lifespan of people, there was quite a long time. You know, people didn't live to be quite so, so old in this at that time. Um, so, you know, they, they looked after their houses. And you can do this in three dimensions, but it perhaps doesn't tell you a lot more. Here's a really simple example. We got some clay pottery samples from Fiji. And this person, Patrick Nunn, that we collaborated with there, he was very interested to know, did they all come from the same source? Because there was interest in trading between different islands on Fiji. And actually, we answered this question really quickly, because we found some of the pots had a big carbonate peak, and quite a lot didn't. And we knew that carbonate was present in the site on, um, on the main island of Fiji where they got the clay to make these pots. The archaeologists knew where that was. And therefore, the ones that didn't contain carbonate were probably the ones that had been taken from elsewhere. We estimated about 30% of the samples had come from elsewhere. And we didn't know what number they were looking for, but that was apparently precisely the number they were looking for, that about 30% had been traded from other islands. So... That was a nice, quick, quick sort of fix. The only alternative is that they've heated these so hot that they've destroyed the carbonate peak, but we know that sort of technology was beyond them. They had to heat to about 1,000 degrees to destroy calcium carbonate, and at that time they couldn't heat these things to 1,000 degrees. They didn't have that, that technology. Hackberries, they're things that exist. You find them at Chapel Hoyek. They actually have aragonite in their outer shells. Aragonite is a calcium carbonate form, and you can detect these. If you want to find out, is it, a, is it a hackberry, you can find out very quickly by recording the infrared spectrum. It shows you that very quickly. There's a big peak from calcium carbonate from aragonite. And that's a component of the sort of outside part of these, these objects. Um, so these are then some other things we've done, identifying coprolites, looking at mineralized remains, looking at ochres. They're things that people use as coloring agents. And the building materials at Chapel Hoyek. These are just some samples from Silchester, just down the road. Archaeology have had a big project with Silchester. We got very interested in a cesspit that they found down there. Why cesspit's <coughs> interesting? Well, you can find out evidence for what people were eating by looking at Look at the cesspit. The archaeologist was very interested to identify coprolites, which are sort of preserved preserve fecal remains. If you can identify it as a coprolite, you can then do chromatography mass spec experiments, and you can actually still, even at this time period, you can still find preserved things like bile acids and cholesterol derivatives, which could tell you what species they're from. So if they're human, well, that might be interesting. But often even more interesting is to find out were people keeping things like sheep or goats or, you know, were they farming? You can find that out. But you waste a lot of time if you look at things like that that aren't actually coprolites. And infrared can allow you to tell that very quickly because you can see phosphate peaks. But if you see very strong phosphate peaks, then it's almost certainly going to be from a coprolite. Now, this particular cesspit was interesting because it was full of these mineralized remains. These are cereal grains. We found cereal grains, different types of fruit pips. We even found maggots. That the maggots, and they've been remarkably well preserved. And if you look at them under a microscope, you could even see the little hairs that are preserved on the maggots. They're beautifully preserved and mineralized. We wrote a paper on this, and we said how you know these have been preserved very, very speedily. Um, I then got one or two rather curious emails that I didn't understand at first. They were from weird places in America. And what it turns out is you have groups of people in, in America especially um, from weird sort of religious places that want to prove that the world was founded in 4004 BC, 
But if they, they look for scientific papers where people have said that things like mineralization processes have happened very rapidly because they see that as evidence that fossils and things could have formed on this very rapid time scale. Actually, in this case, there's no secret. We know these things are much less than 4,000 BC. They're Roman, you know, they were around in 2,000 years ago. But they were, I wondered where these emails were coming from, and then I found out from some of my geological friends what they, they're, they're sifting the scientific literature for these things. Why did these preserve so quickly? It's the perfect combination of having carbonate and phosphate ions present together. Carbonate from the background geology around Silchester, which is chalky, phosphate from the, the cesspit environment. And when you look at the infrared spectra of these objects, you find spectra that show there's phosphate peak there, that's this, this peak around about 1,000 wave numbers, and there's a carbonate peak. The interesting thing about the carbonate peak is it's split into two, and the splitting occurs because the carbonate is located in a matrix of phosphates. So it's in a particular environment where the asymmetric stretch, which is degenerate, splits into a doublet. And by looking at that splitting, you can tell something about the mineral phase that you're, you're looking at. We found that this was a mineral phase called darlite, which is a mixed phosphate carbonate type of phase. So, just to come on to my last, very last topic, we we'll do some forensic work. Number of topics here. Where is infrared important? These are just two things to, to look at. One thing that the forensic people are interested in is can you produce very quick sort of tests that, say, the police could use or somebody in a bank could use? And one thing we looked at was looking at identify, identification of forged banknotes. I have links, colleagues of the Northamptonshire Police. Uh, we borrowed their supply of forged £20 notes. We had signed for these and promised to give them all back on pain of being sent to prison, stuck in Northampton jail for a bit or something. But these were notes that had passed a visual inspection and they passed a fluorescence test. You know, people put them under a fluorescent thing and they, they passed that. We just wanted to look very quickly at infrared spectra. And what we found was that if you look, first of all, at the paper, you could see a, a change. And if you look, the other place we looked was on the the strip, the metallic strip, has a polymer film, and if you look at the infrared spectrum of the polymer film, you can find differences. I think this one is the polymer film coming through here, and there's this one at the top is the paper. There's an interesting peak at about 1400 in the paper, and that's present in the real ones and not in the forged ones. And I actually wonder if that's coming from carbonate, because it might, they put China clay into high-quality papers, and I think the forgers might not be sourcing their China clay from the right. They might have been clever enough to get the paper right, but they haven't got the extra bits that they're putting in quite right. And I think that might be the, the answer to that. And another little study we did was looking at if you take paint samples and heat them to different temperatures... Can you make an estimate of the temperature that a paint's been heated to from the infrared spectrum? There are now handheld infrared spectrometers that, in principle, the scene of crimes officer could take to a site and perhaps make some measurements and maybe get an initial idea of what temperatures different parts of a building have been heated to. And what you see is some of the polymers and so degrading. There's a nice carbonyl peak up here that disappears quite clearly at an early temperature. A really interesting thing, if you go down to these peaks at the bottom, you start to see a water peak appearing when you get to high temperature. I couldn't understand that at first, but then I realised what is happening is that you're degrading the paint sample so that when it cools down, it reacts with water. It becomes more hygroscopic and takes up water. And the appearance of this water peak actually seemed quite definitive of something that had been heated to a high temperature and then cooled again, and not quite what I expected. <laughs> OK, that's a very brief overview. Um, a few colleagues, I hope I've tried to list people that I've either worked with or published with or jointly supervised students with. If I've missed you off and you actually ought to be there, then many apologies. But, yeah, that's just uh, an overview. I've worked with people from all different parts of the department. Uh, one thing I would say is, yeah, this has been a really excellent department to work in in terms of if you have interesting ideas, you always find other people who are interested to work with you on things. If you want to share supervision of a student, 
you can always find people who are interested to share, share students and work together with, with different students. So I think that's been a real positive. What's been the real legacy from my work? Well, I've always felt that the science you produce is interesting, but what's really is important is that you're training young people. I think universities are about teaching young people, training young people. That's the main reason that they exist. And I've always seen that one of my main functions in carrying out research is this aspect of giving a helping start to, to young people, getting them you know, not just to learn the science that they're doing, but the other sort of skills that you need in order to, to move on into the world. I believe that when Humphrey Davy was asked what his greatest discovery was, he said Michael Faraday, and he always answered the question with that response, that Michael Faraday was his greatest discovery. And I also read recently the obituary of um, Louise Johnson, who was a very good biomedical, biochemical scientist working on crystal structures, but I worked with her at Diamond when we were looking, setting up the infrared beam line, and Louise Johnson's view was always that the important things, you know, she did some really top quality research on lysozyme and things of that type, but she always maintained that what was really important were her students. You know, that was the important thing. And that's very much my um, feeling. I've supervised a lot of PhD students over the years. You know, that's, uh, I think, and that to me is what I've, Contributed, you know, my papers may well be forgotten about in the in the future, but I, you know, I think many of these people are now moving on into into more senior positions. So, and many of these have had joint supervision, and where we've had joint supervision, that's always been, I think, a positive thing to work with other people on on projects. You can extend into areas that you don't fully understand yourself if you work with other people. So, a long list of PhD students, and also from our MSc research, which I think is always is a very important degree in providing, um, you know, providing a taste of research for people that perhaps don't want to commit to the whole three-year three-year experience, but they could do a one-year a one-year degree where they learn a lot about research methodology, research techniques. I think. Okay, that's all I want to say. Thank you for coming and thank you for your attention. Um, as I say, a general overview, but I hope that just gives you a feeling for you know, what I've been up to in the time I've been here when I haven't been giving lectures or meetings or all these other things that we have to do all the time. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. people have questions, I will answer, but you can always find me at some point and, um, you know, there's plenty of opportunity to find me and talk to me about things, you know, so um, maybe we don't need to have a formal question and answer. Elizabeth has a... Well, it's, it's more of an observation than a question, and what's your solution? That was an excellent talk, I think. Um, thank you very much. Um, it was very nice to see. I know you very well, <laughs> but I didn't know if I was thinking Thank you. Second observation was on the slide about the wedding. You missed out a very important wedding. Yes, I know. My, my, my fourth PhD student actually got married to me. So. <laughs> <laughs> but that's an unrepeatable. That happened once. But, it... <laughs> but I, I think that, that's also quite a, a landmark. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. yes yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So. No, thank you. I mean, Elizabeth is actually probably originally responsible for getting me interested in experimental science because I, when I first arrived in this department, my first postgraduate demonstrator in the department was, was Elizabeth. Because Elizabeth, I was an undergraduate, Elizabeth just finished her oh, PhD. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> About the same as me. But, um, so we had to do gravimetric analysis, and the first time I got my gravimetric analysis wrong, but Elizabeth made me do it again. But I, I got it right the second time, and that taught me that you had, you know, the importance of actually being careful about experiments, that it's important to do experiments carefully, otherwise your answers don't mean anything, actually. You know, you've got to do things, got to do things carefully. Gravimetric analysis is a good way of telling that, because you know if the answer's right or not. So, it actually comes down in the end to whether you did it did it properly or not, you know. So Elizabeth was the first person to get me interested in um, you know, practical chemistry when I met at Reading. Okay, thank you everyone.